So what kind of task does AI automate then? If we see AI as this whole progression to augmented individuals, if you will, to individual creativity and productivity, which tasks are on the cutting board? For this, I feel like I am bound to introduce a new word, because we don't have good words for this. We, we think about whole jobs. That's the wrong way to think about it. See, for every task, there is a thinking piece and what I like to call a thunking piece. And thunk being like the dull thunk of a brick hitting the ground, that mindless, brainless task. Or think of it as you want to go through the door, you could you know, use your head as a battering ram and thunk, thunk, thunk on the task. Or you could do a little bit of thinking and see what you're dealing with and realize that maybe the door handle is the solution to the problem. That's the thinking bit. And then once you've thought and you've seen the solution yourself, then to actually execute and pull on the door, uh, there is more thunking again. AI does not automate thinking. It doesn't. There is a lot of strange rumblings about this that sound very odd to me, who's been in the space for two decades, but it doesn't automate thinking. It does automate the thunking component of a task. And you might be like, well, hang on, Cassie, hang on, hang on. What about art? Is that not, are we not automating creative stuff there? Look, if you think that we are replacing the thinking that artists do, I think you've missed like a whole century of art history. So let's go and look at a quick minute of art history for you. So this piece, it's a very famous piece called Fountain, 1917 by Marcel Duchamp. This is an iconic art piece. There was a big thinking component here, which is why this is such an icon, where the artist had to think about what needs to be said in the artistic conversation. What is important? What are the ideas? How do I capture this and convey it to others? And then he could have actually gone and learned how to work with porcelain and he could have carved and sculpted this himself, but he didn't. He took a ready-made urinal, he signed a name on it, not even his name, and brought it to the exhibition. So who was the artist there? Are we going to say that it is the toilet manufacturer that is the artist? I would argue strongly against. The thinking component was knowing what is worth saying, knowing what is worth doing. We are thinking when we are coming up with ideas, when we are solving problems, when we're being creative, when we're interacting with one another, not in a we've pre-planned our speech and we're not, uh, we've sort of checked out of the conversation, but when we're having true conversations with one another, we're focusing, we're reacting, that's when we're thinking. When we're inspiring and being inspired. All of that remains, and I believe that that is the best of how humanity can spend its time. And it is often when we are thunking that we're distracted from our opportunities to think, to solve the world's most important problems. Anyone who says, hey, there'll be nothing left to do after AI, after automation, after uh, productivity revolution, hasn't seen just how much is Suboptimal, I'll call it suboptimal in the world. As long as we have medicines that have been undiscovered, diseases uncured, inefficiencies, we have, as long as we have climate problems, as long as we have a future to invent, there is plenty to think about and plenty to do. We're going to have plenty to work on and there will always be stuff to do. There will always be ways to participate. But also secretly, there's this rumbling about this concept of secret cyborgs. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this. This concept is essentially that people would love to get their thunking automated. Once you see the solution, you would love to say, okay, now someone else do it, now AI do it, now machine do it. You'd love to do that. But you're scared that your boss will find out. That might be the biggest problem. That Management has not learned how to manage thinking, only how to manage thinking. What you can measure easily, 
which you can observe easily. How many hours has someone sat in a chair? How many times have they done a repetitive task? Whereas thinking is something you can't force. You can only get in the way of it. I don't believe that there is a person who can sit and think truly at your full creative potential for nine hours a day. You need that space in between. We should be okay with that. We should be stepping up as managers and as teachers too. And thinking about how to lead in a society where there might be some space around the thinking. And that's okay. Now you might be saying, okay, but what if we let AI do the thinking? On philosophical grounds, I completely reject this notion. AI cannot think. AI can automate and AI can execute decisions. When you are not the one making the decision and it looks like the machine is doing it, there is someone who is actually making that decision for you. Whoever built the technology, that is the person doing the thinking. And I think that we've been complacent. We've allowed our technology to be faceless. Even if I have a, a cup that someone designed stupidly has a hole in the bottom, I pour coffee in there, it goes all over me. If I react to this, I'm like, ah, stupid cup. It's a dangerous reaction. The better reaction is, who designed this thing this way? Let's have a conversation about that. Is that a right and useful design for users, for society? Now, with a cup, it's bad enough, but at least it's easy to do, to go from the, the object to the person. But what about these large-scale systems? Well, let me tell you, there are definitely people who are making subjective decisions designing these things. We need to start seeing them. We need to stop allowing technology to be faceless. When we program the traditional way, how do we get the task done? Some human being has to agonize over every single line. So you want to automate a task, it takes 10,000 lines of code, 100,000 lines of code. Either you have to write them all and think about them all, or some other human being has to have done that and you take the package and plug it in. But when it comes to AI, there are actually only two lines behind all that fiddling. Optimize this goal on that data set, go. Two lines of thought that can scale up and affect millions of lives, billions of lives. These two lines require as much thought and respect as those 10,000 or 100,000 lines of code. And if we don't see the people who are doing this, if we say, ah, oh, the machine makes the decisions, it's some bunch of mathematics, of course it's objectively correct. How will we hold them accountable for quality, for wisdom? These two lines are fundamentally subjective. What is success? How do we make trade-offs? What's good? What's worth doing? What isn't? Which mistakes do we tolerate and which mistakes do we not? Very subjective decisions right there that require a lot of decision skill. And on that data set, which data set, which examples do we want to teach with? Which examples are inappropriate? What kind of world are we describing to the machine and is that the world that we want to build later? This is a way to amplify the impact of decision makers. So let AI stand for amplified impact of individuals, of users, of everyone who's going to use it to be more productive, but also of the people for whom this is a grand lever. I hope that we will step up and understand that thinking is our responsibility. And the people who design these systems, I hope that we will hold them accountable for bringing the best of humanity to that design rather than the worst of us. So I'll leave you with that thought. This is about thinking and we will all have space to think more in the future. It's time that we took our skills at it seriously, learned to become better designers, better decision makers, and let's step up to it and build a better future together. Thank you very much.